For the next 31 days on the FCPA Compliance Report, we're going to be bringing you a daily tip, strategy, or idea that you can use to improve your program. Here's your host, Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist. This month's sponsor of 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program is Affiliated Monitors. Founded in 2004, Affiliated Monitors provides professional, independent, integrity monitoring and ethics and compliance assessments nationally and internationally and across almost all industries. With its knowledge of effective ethics and compliance programs and cultures, Affiliated Monitors is respected for its work as the corporate monitor on matters ranging from multinational corporations to small and mid-sized companies and even individuals. Having served in over 750 monitorships, no one has more experience as an independent monitor than the team at Affiliated Monitors. For more information on how an independent monitor can help improve your company's ethics and compliance programs, visit this month's sponsor, Affiliated Monitors, at www.affiliatedmonitors.com. Opinion Release 1402, Dislinking the Illegal Conduct Going Forward. One of my favorite words in the context of FCPA enforcement is dislink. It is a useful adjective in explaining how certain conduct by a company must be separated from the winning of business, and more broadly, it works on many different levels when discussing the FCPA. The concept of dislinking was most prominently laid out in Opinion Release 1402. It provided one of the most concrete statements from the Department of Justice on the unidimensional nature of compliance in the mergers and acquisition context, both in the pre-acquisition and post-acquisition phases. In this opinion release, the requester was a multinational company headquartered in the United States. The requester desired to acquire foreign consumer product, a foreign consumer products company and its wholly owned subsidiary both of which were incorporated and operated in an unnamed foreign country. It had never issued securities in the United States and had negligible business contacts in the United States, including no direct sales or distributions of their products in the United States. In the course of the pre-acquisition due diligence of the target, the requester identified a number of likely improper payments by the target to government officials of a foreign country, as well as substantial weaknesses in accounting and Record keeping. In light of the bribery and other concerns identified in the pre acquisition due diligence process, the requester also detailed a plan for remedial post acquisition measures and post acquisition integration steps. The requester sought from the Department of Justice an opinion as to whether the department would bring an FCPA enforcement action against the requester for the target's pre acquisition conduct. It specifically noted the requester did not seek an opinion from the department as to the requester's criminal liability for any post-acquisition conduct by the target. So what was the pre-acquisition due diligence? In preparing for the acquisition, the requester undertook extensive due diligence aimed at identifying, among other things, the potential legal and compliance concerns at the target. The requester retained an experienced forensic accounting firm to carry out the due diligence review. This review brought to light the evidence of apparent improper payments, as well as substantial accounting weaknesses and poor record keeping. The accounting firm reviewed approximately 1,300 transactions with a total value of $12.9 million, with over 100,000 in transactions that raised compliance issues. The vast majority of these transactions involved payments to government officials related to obtaining, obtaining permits and licenses. Other transactions involved gifts and cash donations to government officials, charitable contributions and sponsorships, and payments to members of media controlled, excuse me, state controlled media to minimize negative publicity. None of these payments occurred inside the United States and none were through a U.S. person or, and apparently none went through a U.S. bank. The due diligence showed that the target had significant record keeping deficiencies. Further, the records which did exist did not support the clear majority of the cash payments and gifts to foreign government officials and the charitable contributions. There were expenses that were improperly and inaccurately classified. The accounting records were so disorganized that the accounting firm who did the forensic audit was unable to physically locate or identify many of the underlying records for the transactions. Finally, the target had not developed or implemented a written code of conduct or other compliance policies and procedures 
nor did the target's employees show an adequate understanding of the awareness of anti-bribery laws. What about the proposed post-acquisition remediation? The requester presented several post-closing steps to remediate the target's weaknesses around the time of the plan closing. The requester aimed to complete the integration of the target into its compliance and reporting structure within one year of closing and presented an integration schedule of the target into the acquire, which included various risk mitigation steps, dissemination, and training with regard to compliance procedures, standardizations of business relationships with third parties, and formalization of the target's accounting and record keeping in accordance with the requestor's application. So what did the DOJ have to say? Well, DOJ first said that as none of the payments were made in the U.S. by the uh, target, none went through the U.S. banking system and none involved a U.S. person or entity, it should not lead to the creation of liability for the acquiring company. Moreover, there would be no <clears throat> continuing or ongoing illegal conduct going forward because no contracts or other assets determined to have been acquired through bribery would remain in operation. Therefore, there would be no jurisdiction under the FCPA to pr- prosecute going forward. Additionally, there was a significant amount of pre-acquisition due diligence and a pre-acquisition risk assessment engaged in by the target. The DOJ communicated several important messages through Opinion Release 1402. First, it demolished the myth of springing liability to an acquiring company in the FCPA context, context, context and buying an FCPA violation simply through an acquisition. All of this means there must be continuing illegal conduct for the F, for FCPA liability to rise. Most clearly, beginning with the 2012 guidance, both the DOJ and SEC have communicated what companies need to do in the M&A context. While many compliance practitioners had previously focused on post-acquisition integration and remediation. The clear import of 1402 is to re-emphasize the importance of pre-acquisition due diligence. Due diligence must begin in the pre-acquisition phase. The steps taken by the requester in this opinion release demonstrate many of the techniques you can use in your pre-acquisition due diligence, such as having internal or external um, legal accounting and compliance review a target sales and financial data customer contracts, third-party, and distributor agreements, performing a risk-based analysis of the target's company ba- customer base, performing an audit of selected transactions engaged in by the target, and engaging with discussions with the target's key personnel about what their values are around bribery and corruption. Whether you make these inquiries or not, you will also need to engage in post-acquisition integration or remediation. 1402, opinion release 1402, that is, taken together with the steps laid out in the 2012 FCPA guidance, has clearly provided the actions needed after the transaction is closed. If you cannot perform any or even an adequate pre-acquisition due diligence, the time frames you have put you must put in place after the acquisition closes may need to be compressed, and you may make sure that they are not continue the uh, target or former target, I suppose, would be continuing any nefarious conduct going forward. But all of this goes back to my favorite term, dislinking. If a target is engaging in conduct that violates the FCPA, but the target itself is not the subject of the jurisdiction of the FCPA, you simply cannot allow the conduct to continue. If you do allow the conduct to continue, you will have brought an FCPA violation upon yourself and your company. So what are today's three key takeaways? Number one, in the M&A context, the key is to dislink any illegal conduct going forward from that which may have occurred previously. Two, Opinion Release 1402 provides the clearest roadmap for both pre-acquisition and post-acquisition compliance actions in the M&A context. And number three, never forget the opinion release procedure itself. It has now been successfully used in two important M&A matters, One we previously discussed, the Halliburton uh, opinion release, 0802, and now in 1402. 
This gives you the opportunity for very creative lawyering and may help you if you face, find yourself faced with a similar situation. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to thank you again for joining me for this episode of 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program around business ventures. And I hope you will join me for our next episode tomorrow. Also, I'd like to shout out to our sponsor, Affiliated Monitors, for sponsoring this month's podcast series. This podcast series on 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.